Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Organic Matter Trash Talk. For those of you familiar with it, Organic Matter is my podcast where I would have my friends read short stories that I've written, um, and I'm still going to be doing that. I have some more stories that I'm writing right now. In the meantime, I've gotten more comfortable um, hearing the sound of my voice and editing the sound of my voice and being on camera, um, and I've also gotten better at writing. So I have stories that have more uh, well-rounded arcs to them, and I think the characters are better developed. But that's coming later because I still have to finish editing and write write a couple more stories probably and things like that. Um, So for now, I made this subsection of my podcast that I'm calling Trash Talk because I read a lot. And I read a lot of very, very, very good books that I just adore. But I also read a lot of terrible books that I honestly don't know how they got published. I can't, I can't figure it out. It's a mystery. I don't know. I don't understand. And last year, the book that really was the, the, the worst book that I had read was The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager. And it was so, oh, I can I don't even know what to say. It was so bad and it was so critically acclaimed. And I I think I'm going to maybe later do a separate video about it because it's one thing, I think, to, to have a bad book and have a book be bad. And that's fine. But I think it's a whole other animal when someone writes a bad book and then everyone's like, this is the best book in the world. And you're like, no, no, and it wins awards and stuff, and I can't figure it out. Stop rewarding mediocrity. Just stop. Just stop. Don't do that. Don't do that. So I have a million reasons that I had a problem with that book, but I don't have time to get into that now. So I'm going to take it down a notch, and we're going to talk about a book that I think is the worst book I've read so far in 2019, and that book is The Magpies by Mark Edwards. Um, I think that books like these are the reason that some people think they don't like reading. And I know that sounds harsh, but that's probably the nicest thing that I'm going to say about this book, to be honest with you. Um, So before we get into it, I'm going to read the synopsis of this very horrible, terrible book that I can't stand. Meet the neighbors from hell in the gripping thriller that reviewers and readers describe as fast-paced, chilling, and impossible to put down. When Jamie and Kirsty move into their first home together, they are full of optimism. The future in which they plan to get married and start a family is bright. The other residents of their building seem friendly too, including the Newtons, a married couple who welcome, welcome them to the building with open arms. But then strange things start to happen. Dead rats are left on their doorstep. They hear disturbing noises and much worse in the night. After Jamie's best friend is injured in a horrific accident, Jamie and Kirsty find themselves targeted by a campaign of terror. As they are driven to the edge of despair, Jamie vows to fight back, but he has no idea what he is really up against. The Magpies is a gripping psychological thriller in which the monsters are not vampires or demons, but the people who live next door. It is a nightmare that could happen to anyone. Okay, so maybe the synopsis should have clued me into the fact that this book was going to be really boring. <sighs> because Jamie and Kirsty, in the first chapter, you're introduced and then you're like, okay, these are the most boring people imaginable. They are like your average um, middle class American uh, getting ready to settle down and have a family. There is nothing exciting about them. We don't learn anything about them that makes them unique. We aren't told anything about their family or their childhood or um, memories that they have or like what their favorite flavor of ice cream is or I don't even know, like what shoe size, I don't, it doesn't matter. We don't learn anything about them that makes them three-dimensional, that makes them real people. All we know is that their names are Jamie and Kirstie and you could literally replace them with any other cardboard person in the world. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who they are. So... The book starts out pretty heavy-handed. The first line is, in the prologue, she crossed out paradise and wrote hell in its place. And you're like, okay, I I get it, I get it. It's dark. 
Um, so it takes you through the first person that lived in this apartment. Um, she's not the main character. She's just moving out of the apartment. Um, it's a lot of f foreboding language. Um, watching her memories burn, but even that would not erase the images from her mind. They were locked inside her, and she could only hope that time would erode them. Uh, more than anything else, she wanted to forget. Um... It goes on, it like waxes on about how perfect the apartment was at first and how much they loved it at first and how now it's just this terrible, it's become a nightmare. Uh, so it goes on and on and it doesn't really give you a whole lot of, it doesn't give you a whole lot of details to go on. It's just this woman is upset. She didn't like living here. It was a bad experience. She has bad memories. She has nightmares. She wants to get out of there. She doesn't like loud noises. Okay. So I don't like to judge books from the first couple pages. So I was like, didn't really like the writing. It didn't didn't flow very well, but that's okay. It's a prologue. I'll see if I can get into it. So chapter one is Jamie and Kirsty, our cardboard couple, are moving in. They love the apartment. Within the first chapter, the first page even, he kissed her neck and breathed in her scent. A cocktail of skin and apricot shampoo and the perfume she applied every morning. So from that point forward, I was like, okay, this couple's going to be doing it a lot. But as long as they're just mentioning doing it, they're like, okay, the couple had sex. Great. Okay. I know where the relationship is. They like to have sex. That's fine. I can handle it. It's not very interesting to me. It doesn't drive the plot forward in any way, but it's fine. But as the book goes on and on and on, the... <sighs> So the author has a big problem with telling instead of showing. He tells you something is something happened instead of showing you how it happened and playing the scene out in front of you. So everything feels very passive. Um, except when it comes to the sex scenes, which become more and more detailed as you go. And they get weirder and weirder. And they happen more and more frequently. And eventually I was so uncomfortable and I, you know, I've read a lot of books. Sex scenes happen. It's fine. Some of them are written really beautifully and they're nice. Some of them are funny and it's a good, it's interesting to read. These were just a lot of me pulling my hair and saying, what? No, stop. Why are you doing this? Don't put your finger there. Ah, it was, it was weird to me that the thing that the author wrote best or put the most work into were the sex scenes that did. Uh, mm. No. No. No, 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 no. No. So it starts out really boring. They're having a party. <sighs> like a housewarming party. Having a lot of friends over. It's a costume party. So they go into a lot of detail about um, what everyone's dressing as. There's awkward flirting. Jamie adopted what he thought was a wicked grin, sneaking his hand around her back and pulling her against his bare torso. She kissed his chest and looked up at him with her big brown eyes. What will I go as, he asked. How about the devil? Like, so witty. You guys are so interesting. I love them. So many times you read the phrase, the flat was perfect. If I had the patience, I would go through and mark down every single time the author writes, the flat was perfect, but I don't have the patience. This book already bored me to death. I'm dead. I don't want to waste my afterlife marking that down. Tedious. Kirsty is a nurse, I believe, and Jamie works in the tech industry, but they don't super go into it a whole lot. Uh, they end up meeting their upstairs neighbors, and one of their neighbors is a children's horror author that never really becomes relevant. It's just kind of thrown in there. Uh, and he has a wife, and there's some mention of their upstairs, like, right above them. So the second floor neighbor being a witch, but that's tedious. At one point, Kirsty gets sick, and the witch neighbor says, Oh, let me bring you something that will heal you, and she brings Kirsty ginger root. And it instantly fixes her. Like, they make tea with it, and it's, like, this magic thing. But, like, Bish, you just made ginger tea. And the author's presenting it like it's this, ooh, it's magic. And Jamie and Kirsty have never heard of this before. But, like, you made tea. You can get it at a supermarket. You, but, great. I don't know what you want from me. Like, am I supposed to be fascinated by this 
w- world of magic that's going on under here. I don't, I don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Uh, at one point, they end up having dinner with their downstairs neighbors that they meet that are kind of off-putting, but like, they seem nice at first. They seem normal. So they have dinner with their downstairs neighbors and two of their friends who are having like some sexual tension between them. So it's it's this girl, Heather, and this guy that I can't even remember his name because nobody has a defining distinctive personality here. Uh, so they want to be in each other's pants, but they don't want to admit it to each other. So it's their two downstairs neighbors who we kind of are starting to think like these are probably the problem neighbors and their two friends who want to hook up but don't want to hook up. So it's kind of a boring dinner. Mm, Sometimes their downstairs neighbors make weird faces at times and seem uncomfortable, but nothing really happens. There's too much detail. Nothing happens. Please let me die. Okay, the book gets super boring for a while. Um, The downstairs neighbors are named Lucy and Chris. So basically things start to happen like, um, like the fire department shows up and says, who called the fire department? Uh, it was from this apartment. It was your number. Uh, why did you call the fire department? Where's the fire? And our main characters are like, we didn't call you. And the fire department's like, don't fuck with us. Um, it's boring. I don't know. Stuff like that keeps happening or like pizza keeps getting delivered that they didn't order. Um, and then like everyone's pissed off at them and they're getting junk mail. And there's also a cat in this book which made me sick to my stomach because I thought the cat was going to die. There were so many times I thought that they were going to kill the cat, which is like a big no-no for me. Like, I already didn't like this book, and then I was like, if you kill this cat, but the book never killed the cat. Nothing really happened with the cat, and that was its one saving grace. That was the one thing I liked about the book, that it didn't do the lazy thing and kill a cat. Um, At a certain point, Jamie finds a dead rat on their doorstep, which I think that the dead animal trope is so overdone. Please stop doing it. Just stop doing it. It's not necessary. It doesn't... Are you trying to show me that they are willing to hurt creatures? It's it's the laziest trope that I can imagine. Not that I'm like, oh, kill, like hurt people instead. Don't do that either. But, you know, if you're trying to create a dark character, it's kind of a cop-out. It's, it's lazy writing to have them do something to an animal or have like an, a hurt or dead animal. It's boring. It's been done so many times before. You can find more creative ways to illustrate that these people are not good and are not afraid of harming life. Oh, another thing, Kirsty this whole time is having nightmares that she's being chased through the woods uh, by a witch and some birds, which are sort of described as magpies, which is pretty heavy handed because, oh, there's the title of our book. Got it. Okay, we got that in there. Keep moving. At one point, they find out that their downstairs neighbors have keys to their apartment, which they're kind of perturbed about. (sighs) Boring stuff. Boring. More boring. Just going to keep going through all of the boring. So at one point, the downstairs neighbors invite them to go go go-karting. And so they invite are two cardboard people, Jamie and Kirsty, and their two cardboard friends that are into each other. So they're all going to the go-kart track, having a great time, and the guy friend is being all manly, and he's like, I want to feel adrenaline and show that I'm a tough guy. I'm a tough kid. I can kick butt. So he goes off and tries to race the, the downstairs neighbor guy, whose name is Chris, and he gets horribly, horribly injured due to a mistake that Chris, a mistake that Chris makes. And it's kind of implied that like Chris might have done it on purpose. So their friend ends up in a coma. Um, And so this budding relationship between the two cardboard friends ends up being all dramatic and nothing really happens there, nothing too exciting. It's just that the lady cardboard friend is like sad all the time and the male cardboard friend is in a coma. So then after that, they don't hear anything from their downstairs neighbors. There's not even, they don't check to see how the friend is who's in a coma. They don't apologize. They don't do anything. They don't reach out. It's just radio silence. No more sex scenes. It's very tedious. And then they get a letter from their downstairs neighbors that says, we have become increasingly disturbed recently by the level of noise coming from your flat. The music you play at high volumes, blah, blah, blah. The sound of your, you having sexual intercourse has become quite intolerable. Um, it's like a really rude letter. Um, we hope that you will act to ensure that we do not need to write to you like this again. 
So, you know, it, it's a rude letter. Whatever. Um, it's more like passive aggressive neighbor shit. So they end up having these really rude passive aggressive letter exchanges that just get kind of worse and worse and devolve. And then at some point, the War of the Worlds soundtrack starts playing at high volumes every night, which apparently uh, Jamie was traumatized by in his childhood. Um, I think the police get called on Jamie and Kirsty for trespassing at one point. Boring, boring stuff. More boring happens. A lot of things happen in this book that don't matter. They don't do anything for the plot. Um, he he keeps on telling instead of showing, but he does it in such a long-winded way that you're like, Shh, shut up. I think the only thing that kept me reading was the cat because I wanted to know that the cat was okay. And that's the only reason. That was the, That was the only reason that I wanted to read this book was to find out if the cat was okay. Which is pretty par for the course with me, but also the book is bad. If I didn't like cats, I would have probably just stopped reading. It's a dumb book. They start getting more and more junk mail and mail-ordered things that they then have to pay for for some reason. Kirsty gets pregnant and the sex scene leading up to her get pre getting pregnant is increasingly graphic. Like... Their fingers go places that I don't need to know about. Like, if you're into that, that's fine, but you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell me about where fingers are going. I'm fine. I don't need to have that information. Part of it is that I feel like if I liked these characters and respected them, I would feel rude knowing all of these very personal details. But I don't like these characters, and I don't respect them, and I don't care about them at all, and I just feel repulsed by it. That's all I felt reading these sex scenes. I didn't feel any kind of, like, uh, affection for their relationship or any sort of, like, oh, well, this is nice. Like, I like seeing their relationship progress like this. Or, oh, yay, they're pregnant. I just felt utter revulsion. And this book is too dang long for all of the nothing that happens. I'm going to skip ahead. So their friend who's in a coma wakes up from a coma and he ends up breaking up with their other friend who was in love when, like, they were in love and then he went into a coma and then he woke up and he was like, I don't love you anymore. And he kind of turns into a sociopath and then he leaves. He's like, a goodbye. And he goes off backpacking someplace to, and he also says that he wants to, like, screw a bunch of other women. Um, it's very dumb. It's very pointless. Nothing happens there either. Very stupid. Don't care. Skipping ahead, skipping ahead. They end up writing to the person who lived in the apartment before them and uh, asking like what happens to them and she writes back and is like, it's terrible, get out of there. You know, do something about it. And Kirsty's like, I'm having a baby, I want to move. And Jamie's like, I'm defending our nest, we can't move because I'm a man. And that's pretty much his only personality trait is toxic masculinity to the point where he's willing to endanger his wife and his unborn child over his masculinity. It's stupid. It is the dumbest. It makes him even less likable than he was before. So then at a certain point, it's icy outside, the weather's bad, and their downstairs neighbor Chris is like, hey, I'm going to fix that squeaky door for you, the one that leads outside. And he leaves some oil or something on the stoop. And then Kirsty is very pregnant at that point, and she slips, and she miscarries the baby. It dies. And it's terrible. And they're trying to insinuate that Chris intended for that to happen, um, which is a, a reach that, you know, like you spilled something. I'm going to spill something personally. Like, I wonder how many other times he might have just been in the background of their lives just spilling things like spilling milk, spilling ice, spilling toothpaste, just like hoping that, th that she would trip. And like, finally, she tripped and she was like eight and a half months pregnant. And if he's been trying to get her to trip for like seven months now and she finally did it. Um, that's a lot of work to go to. I don't, I don't know. Oh, and then when they write this other lady, she's like, yeah, I think he murdered my friend, but I'm not sure. So they're like, hmm, is he a serial killer? But then at a certain point, Kirsty is like, to Jamie, she goes, you have to give up this obsession with beating them at their own game. Like, we just need to move and then we can start over. And he's like, I don't want to. Um, they go to Scotland, I think, to get married it's dumb, nothing happens, they get married, it's like, 
he keeps describing their Scotland adventure where they get hitched. Like something is going to happen. Like you think that something important is going to happen. And instead he's just like, yeah, they got married and it was nice. And then they came back and you're like, what? They could have just stayed boyfriend and girlfriend for the whole of the book. Them being married did absolutely nothing to change the plot, except for a couple pages later when Kirsty leaves him, you're like, but you're married. Like you just left. Okay, but you just got married and now you're leaving him. Not like, oh, we can work through this or talk it out because we just got married. It's, nope, uh, gotta go. And then you don't hear anything else from Kirsty for the rest of the book. And then from there, it's just Jamie going down this weird spiral of like falling to shit. He tries to take out a hit on his downstairs neighbors where he's, he's like trying to get them killed. He takes out all of his savings all of the money he has and he tries to get them killed and then their downstairs neighbor apparently also works in the tech industry so he takes over the company that jamie works for it's a whole thing and then at a certain point jamie just snaps and he kind of colludes with the other tenants but not really so they help him get uh the downstairs neighbors out of their apartment long enough that jamie can go down and have a look and he finds camera footage Apparently they had installed cameras in the building and then you find out that actually they own the whole building. Um, so if they wanted to sell the apartment, they probably couldn't. Um, they'd have to like either take a loss on it or just like stay there forever. Um, and then you start to find evidence that like, oh, they don't even live in the same room because they are psychopaths and they're incapable of love. So they just don't share a room and they're narcissists. There's pictures of themselves all over each of their rooms and then you start to get insinuations that Chris has murdered a lot of people, so he's a serial killer. And so instead of taking all of this evidence and going to the police and doing something reasonable about it and saying like, hey, this guy's a serial killer, um, and getting him arrested and getting some justice and maybe then getting his wife back and then having a child and moving on with their lives in this apartment that they love so much, he just burns it down. He just burns the whole building. He lights everything on fire, including like, so it's the basement apartment. So he just starts a fire and he's like, that perfect apartment that I was trying to protect? Frick it, I'm done, I'm out. Just gonna light everything on fire. And you're like, guy, what are you doing? What, what are, what, why, what, why? Stop it, think. He's an idiot. Like, you can't... Didn't like him to begin with, and now I just think that he is the dumbest. The dumbest. So anyway, then he ends up... I guess he's, like, homeless wandering. He's uh, a, a an alcoholic. And then he starts to get back on the wagon toward the end of the book, and then I guess we're supposed to believe that the sequels are going to be him, uh, I don't know, trying to get revenge or something... So you have him in, I guess it's kind of like a halfway house at the end of the book. And he has a, a roommate and it kind of builds it up to be like, oh my god, it's going to be Lucy. It's going to be his crazy downstairs neighbor who just lost her husband. But no, it's just some lady. And then it cuts to him going through the USB that he found in the apartment that apparently he did save of all of the people that Chris has supposedly murdered. And instead of taking it to the police, he's just kept it. And then at the end of the book, you come to The Magpies, Letter from the Author. Dear reader, thank you for reading The Magpies, and I hope you enjoyed it. All one sentence. If you can give me another few minutes of your time, I'm going to talk about the book and hopefully answer some of the questions you might have. Since The Magpies was first published, I've had many emails, messages, and reviews, and there are a number of recurring themes and queries that I'm going to address in this letter. And so he goes on to be like, this is why I wrote this. This is what it's about. This is what happened. Um, the Magpies is based on real events that happened to me when I was in my late 20s, the same age as Jamie and Kirstie, although I was renting, fortunately. Uh, blah, 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 blah. He had unpleasant neighbors. When plotting the Magpies, I set out to write a relentless, spiraling tale in which the situation gets worse and worse and the reader feels a growing sense of dread. I did not feel a growing sense of dread. I felt... I felt so bored. I felt bored to tears. I ended up just skipping whole paragraphs because nothing mattered anymore. He explains why it's called magpies, which, okay, fine. 
There is no Hollywood ending for Jamie and Kirstie, especially Jamie. Which, so he puts, there is no Hollywood ending for Jamie and Kirstie, comma, capital E on the especially Jamie. Like, proofread your shit, guy. The story is meant to run towards an in inevitable conclusion without authorial tricks. To manufacture a twist in the tale would have been cheating. It wouldn't have been the story I wanted to tell. Well, it might have been interesting. You might have made an interesting book instead of this, like, dung heap here. Firstly, is Mary a witch? Not really, though she is interested in the occult. Lucy accuses Mary of being a witch because she wants Jamie and Kirsty to wonder about the weird incidents that she has planned. She wants them to feel paranoid and afraid. So I feel like if you write a letter like this at the end of your book, if you feel like you have to, to write a letter like this explaining your book to your readers, you haven't done a good job writing your book. You've done a very bad job because your book should just be able to stand alone. It shouldn't... You should be able to write your book, put it into the world, and it should just speak for itself. If you have to write an explanation at the end of your book saying why you did things this way, it's a bad book. Oh, here he says, I also get asked a lot about the sex scenes. I included the sex because it's an important part of Jamie and Kirstie's relationship, and it plays a vital part in the plot and their deteriorating happiness. Lucy and Chris attack their sex life through the complaints and recordings and the joyful compassion of Jamie and Kirstie's early days in the flat is replaced by something more desperate before dwindling away entirely. There are more tasteful ways that that could have been done. Um, maybe also by realizing that a relationship isn't just sex. Because it's very boring if it is, and if I'm constantly reading about how a relationship is growing only through sex, and how it's falling apart only through sex, I am so... I need to find, I'm going to pull up a th thesaurus page right now for other words for bored. Okay, here we go. This book made me uninterested, disinterested, fatigued. Fatigued is a good, I definitely, this book made me fatigued. Tired, dull, blasé, inattentive, sick and tired, spiritless, turned off. I would say I was all of those. Apathetic, disenchanted, disentranced, fed up, indifferent, mm, lukewarm. No, I was not lukewarm. I hated this book. Unmoved, definitely. Not a moving, not compelling. Oh, and then he closes it. So remember, um, the main characters kept finding dead rats on their doorstep. So he closes it by saying, and if you find any dead rats outside your door tonight, don't have nightmares. It's just a dead rat. Probably. Like, okay, guy, it wasn't that creepy. It was the, I mean, like, I wouldn't love to find a dead rat outside my door, but like, have you lived in the city before? Have you, have you lived anywhere before? You're going to find dead mice or dead rats or dead cockroaches. It happens. And so that's why I felt so completely underwhelmed by everything that these characters did in this book, by everything the antagonists did, is because all of it was stuff that I feel like plausibly could happen, has happened, especially if you've lived in a, in a multitude of apartments, in a multitude of places, you've come across bad neighbors. I've had my share of bad neighbors that have made me cry, um, have threatened me, uh, have tried to follow me into my apartment before. Um, you know, it happens. You need to, if you're really going to be trying to convey that these people are psychopaths, you need to push the envelope. There's no point in writing a work of fiction and trying to stay as true as possible to what happened because otherwise just write a memoir. But if you're going to write fiction, embrace that it's fiction. If you're writing a thriller, embrace the, the genre and push the envelope with it. Go as far as you can take it. And if you need to reel it back in the editing process, fine. Um, that's what the editing process is for. But really, just stretch yourself as much as you can. And you, ah, you, think, you need more of a foil for these villains. Like, you could have really made the, the main characters, like, saints. You could have made them really great people. And then it would be even more tragic that this was happening to them. Instead of just making them boring people. And it's nice that Kirstie works in the children's ward of the hospital. Um, and he actually does a good job of kind of rounding out her experiences there, but it's not, it's not quite enough. Um, it's not mentioned enough. It doesn't come through in her actions enough. 
uh, just her day-to-day actions, that she's a compassionate person, we need to see more of this compassion because too often we just get Jamie flying off the handle and her being like, I need to be protected. And he's like, I'll protect you. I'm masculine. And I think it's good that she ends up leaving him when she feels uncomfortable, but it doesn't pay any sort of homage to the relationship that they supposedly have built so far. So I think that this book was really terrible all around. Um, And the fact that this author wrote more books and he's sort of peddled online as a number one bestseller is kind of horrifying to me. And the reviews were all so good. And I don't understand it because this was one of the most mediocre books I've ever read. So it's, I can, the reason that something that is this tepid in quality gets me so fired up is because it, it irritates me because if someone's saying like, this is a good book and you give it to someone who's taking a chance reading for the first time because they haven't liked it in the past and they pick up a book that is so utterly mediocre, they're going to think, oh, this is what reading is and they're not going to like it because nothing good, it, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't play well in your head. If you're reading a good book, like you're immersed in it and you're feeling it happen around you and you're seeing it happen and you're tasting the same things the main characters are tasting and you're feeling the same feelings and you're you're going through everything with them. But in a book like this, you're very aware of like, you're sitting reading it, you can feel your left ass cheek falling asleep. Um, you know, you're like, I'm tired. I How many more chapters in this book? You're going to be constantly checking your progress of the book, which I was doing. Uh, and it's just exhausting and... I just hated it. So that's my review of that book. Thanks for listening to my tirade. Uh, Usually I try to be positive with stuff, but I needed to vent and also for trash talk. I don't know. I think I'm going to talk about uh, other books that I do like at some point. I'm just going to keep calling it trash talk because I'm a gremlin that lives in the garbage. So anything that I say is trash talk. Um, I do have a couple books that I absolutely adored. So maybe I'll talk about those next time. I might talk about movies possibly, but I'm not really a big movie person. Unless, Well, I have movies that I absolutely love, but uh, I don't know if you can hear that. That's my cat meowing. That's Pinecone. What do you need, buddy? Why are you yelling at me? Meow? So in summation, this book was resoundingly mediocre. It was a tedious read. I do not recommend it. Um, there were also, you know, there was some weird sentence structure and things that I didn't go over here because this was more of a rant review, uh, and I kind of just skimmed over parts because it's so boring. Um, But that's my opinion on the book. Let me know if you read this book and you have a different opinion and you think I'm totally off base because if you actually loved it, I would love to hear why and what about it you loved. Um, because at this point I'm just confused. I think it has like four or five stars on Goodreads and I am utterly bewildered. So let me know what you thought. Uh, Subscribe to the podcast if you want to. Follow me on Instagram at Alice LeFay. Go to my website, alicelefay.com. I post paintings, illustrations, um, poetry, short stories. I have some merch that has my art on it that I try to make look like not boring merch. Um... I sell stuff. I hand make some things that I sell. Sometimes I do giveaways. I like interacting with people. If you have a book that you want me to do a rant review of, let me know because I'm always looking for new books to read. Even if they're bad, I get... Oh. Actually, no. Don't let me know if you have a book you want me to do a rant review of. Let me know if you have any great book suggestions. Okay. That's all. Uh, thanks for listening and goodbye. <laughs>